Welcome to Internet Misfits, a podcast that explores new, exciting futures and the people building them. We focus on creators and entrepreneurs who see the world differently. I'm Joe Cohen, your host and the founder and CEO of Universe, an app that lets anyone build an amazing website and online store with just their phone. In this podcast, I try to get at the essence of our guests' unique ways of seeing the world and understand really what makes them tick. My hope is that you leave with new learnings, tools, and inspiration to build out your own dreams. Let's dive in. Welcome, Yael. Thanks, Joe. Um, Thank you for being the first guest on my podcast. I'm very honored. I am new to podcasting, so this is an experiment, but we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure out the flow of it and what makes sense. You know, I think before we get started, I'll introduce you and we'll dive in. So Yael is... One of my best friends, she is the founder of Reformation, which is an incredible, sustainable fashion company. Uh, She started it how many years ago? 2009, 2010. Yeah, so about 13 years. And it's a global brand with hundreds and hundreds of employees. And they've really pushed forward the idea of sustainable fashion in a big way. She stepped down as CEO in 2019 Mm -hmm. and has been working on new ventures since. She's a mom of two and lives in New York. A wife of one. A wife of one. <laughs> uh, Ludwig is amazing, her yeah. husband. But today's conversation is going to be wandering. We're going to talk about the future. We're going to talk about lessons from the past. And we're going to talk about ideas. And I have some bullet points on where we're going to go, but I don't know exactly where okay. we'll end up. So yeah, how does that sound? Fine. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, cool. So- I recently learned about this idea. It's called solar punk. Have you heard of it? No, I heard of steampunk. Yeah. So solar punk is this idea that in a world that is full of dystopian visions, the most radical thing you can do is to be optimistic. And it's this actually whole genre of aesthetics and art. And and they have these sort of incredible landscapes of like green cities and just these positive sci-fi worlds. Mm. And I think that Reformation is like kind of an OG solar punk company. Oh, thank you. Um, And, you know, in 2009, the idea of starting a sustainable fashion company was like pretty radical and pretty optimistically radical. So I'm curious, like, how did it come to be? What's the origin story? So it's so funny, actually, before I get into the origin story, is when we were initially doing the branding exercise, the idea was of this future hippie and that everything about the future was always dystopic. It was always cold and metal and like that we had this vision of the future that was filled with plants and Mm. soft and that what it would be like to be this sort of like bougie, bohem, Mm. creative living in the future. And that was kind of one of the ideas for the stores was to have this like tech enabled store, but to also have it filled with plants and Mm. comfortable furniture and that the future could be comfortable Mm. and cozy. Mm. So I love this solar punk thing. (laughs) I have to go home and research it. Okay. So you were saying in 09 or whenever you were conceiving of Ref, Mm -hmm. you wanted to paint a future that was cozy, but also optimistic and futuristic. That's also because of climate change that it's so overwhelming and terrifying and negative. Hmm. What inspired Ref, but then how did you articulate that vision? Like not just of what the company would be, but stylistically what that future could look like. Okay. So um, I was a regular Garmento lady, which for people that don't know what that means, I just made clothes and sold them. So I had another business before that. And Let's see. I was doing that and I was always really uncomfortable with it. I was I come from a long line of merchants and I wanted to not be a merchant mm. and I had found myself as a merchant. Mm. What's a merchant? In uh, that sense? I guess it's like a buyer and seller of mm. goods. Mm. Right? <laughs> and I did not want to be that. So I was on a trip to China and I was working on a collaboration with Urban Outfitters and I It was the first time that I really experienced um, climate change firsthand. I was in, or pollution and climate change, I guess. I was in this town that produces mostly um, apparel and textiles. 
and the pollution was very real. It was in your face. Like you couldn't really breathe. People were wearing masks. Like if you walked a block, you became winded and coughing. It was just murky everywhere. And I had this This very, and also before I had left for China, I had had a dinner party at my house and this uh, friend brought somebody that worked at the UN and she just looked at me in the face and she said, how do you feel about your impact on the environment as a a person in the fashion industry? And she was telling me it's like the number two most polluting industry in the world. And I was sort of, I had no idea really what she was talking about. I was like, what? Like it didn't, it hadn't occurred to me. This is 2009, maybe. I can't remember exactly. I'm bad at math. Not math. I mean, I'm bad at, <laughs> <laughs> I'm decent at math. I'm bad at dates. Yeah. So I'm in China. I see this and I just have this like moment where I realize, like I have this, I call it like this deep moment of accountability and empathy where I realize it's not these other people that are damaging the environment. It's me. And, and then I started to research the impact of every single item. And I realized that all the clothes that I was making were actually made out of fossil fuels and they took hundreds of years to decompose if they decomposed at all. And I came home and I started to think about that. And I was determined to find sustainable clothing for myself and it was not around. And that's when I kind of had this aha moment, like we need to make, I can start a sustainable fashion brand. Also Mm. at the time, as you know, I was like a big Elon Musk, Mm. Tesla fan Mm. and saw what he was doing with automotives. And I said, listen, if it's happening in automotives, it should happen in Mm in fashion. Mm. And I was a big fan of Whole Foods and this store called Erewhon at the time. And if it's happening in food and agriculture, fashion will be next too. Mm. And so I did that. And then how did it grow? Well, I mean, so you had that initial inspiration. Then what did you do? So the internet was the thing that was existing at the time, but I wasn't really hip to the internet at the time. So I I thought I'd open a store. Mm. So I opened a store and then, you know, the store did really well. But in order to open a new store, you know, you have to save $500,000. It takes a long yeah. time to make $500,000 in a store. So it wasn't happening that quickly. We got yeah. to our third store. And, where, re- and in the, where were the stores? We had one store in the Lower East Side, yeah. one store in Los Angeles, and then one in Soho. And what were you selling in the stores? So initially, so there's a, there's a barrier of entry of fashion of these minimums for fabrics. Mm. Minimums for fabrics and minimums if you're going to order, like, let's say you design a shirt, a whole shirt in China, they're going to say, okay, you have to buy 200, 500, 1,000. But when you have three stores, you don't need 200 of a shirt. Mm. You need 24 Mm. or 48. And so we manufacture domestically. And then there's also a fabric issue. You need these high minimums for fabric. So initially, we bought dead stock fabrics, which is just we went to warehouses with old fabrics that nobody wants and and we bought them and we turned them into clothing. And the idea with that was that was sustainable because right. you were, it's like you were using it. essentially a waste product. Right. You were using the, the fashion equivalent of like food scraps. Yeah, exactly. Or like found art or whatever that's called. And for you, is there like a an aesthetic element to that where like you were making do with what you found or were you having an idea and then finding a fabric that fit to that? I think it was, I had the mission and then after the mission, I was finding out how I was going to have a good business. Mm. So, okay. So you were, you were buying dead stop fabric. We also took vintage clothing and we redid it into new things. What do you mean? Like I would buy a vintage dress that was like maybe like frumpy Mm. and we would put it on a person and then retailer it and then sell it. Would you? It, would it be like one of ones or one of ones? Or sometimes no. Actually, like let's say we would buy bulk, a hundred cashmere sweaters, and we would turn them into a hundred cropped cashmere sweaters. <laughs> huh. Just do little tweaks to things. And were you designing the clothes? Yes. So how did you learn how to design? Well, I am a college dropout and a fashion school dropout, so yeah. I did learn a bit about designing before I dropped mm. out. Um, and then a bit I self-taught. Didn't know that. You 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 studied fashion design? Yeah, I went for like a year or so. At Berkeley? No, no, no. I, yeah. Berkeley was the regular school yeah, dropout. Yeah. And then I went to, it was called Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. In LA? Yes. Huh. I went there for a year and then I dropped out. And then I worked as a designer for many years. That's really? A, that's false. Not many years. Let's just say two or three. <laughs> At someone else's company? Yes. Or? I would like intern and assist. and. Mm-hmm. When you were a designer, were there things that when you were working for other people that you were like, 
no, this is wrong. Or yes, like, all day. That's all I thought all day. Like, like what did you think? Well, all day long, I thought, you're wrong. This is, I knew, like, I would say, we need to make this. And they would say, no. And I would know that that was what they should make. Did Even you when have, I was 19, yeah. I knew it. Is that same sensibility what carried through into ref's work? Like, because I, I feel like, as someone who doesn't wear dresses, <laughs> uh, Reformation, though, has a very distinct aesthetic and like the or the ref dress became like a bit of a an icon yes was that an idea like from a design perspective that you had for a while so it's like a no so it's a combination of two things so one is is that I can kind of I'm not a pre- good predictor of what's going to be cool but I'm mm. good at looking around at what's happening right now and mm. saying these are the six trends like I can mm. I can pick up on trends and then I, I test them and then with ref ref is a very data driven like I'm going to like, I hate this word right now. So I'm going to use it like flywheel Hmm. company. Yeah. (laughs) Where basically what I figured out with ref was that we had to shorten the lead times. Hmm. So basically I, I knew I could figure out what was cool right now, not what was cool in a year. So let's just Hmm. say I could say, okay, well, I'll just give an example. Like I couldn't make a Samba, but Sambas are really cool right now. So let's, let's test Sambas. Bad example. Let me do it again. Motorcycle jackets are really cool right now. Let's test and make a motorcycle jacket. We make the motorcycle jacket. It sells super well. Okay, make another motorcycle jacket. Make a short one. Make a long one. Make a brown one. Make a green one. And yeah. so what we do is we would just test and iterate. And then with just quick production cycles, just be releasing. So it's the same thing like tech, right? Where you're like, we're going to release every single two weeks. Yep. We're going to figure out what's working. And then we're going to keep iterating on it. Yeah, at Universe, we call this Kaizen, which means continuous improvement. And... It's this idea of like, you ship something, you learn, you iterate, and the more that you can ship, the better the product will end up being. It's like a function of the number of cycles that you have. So, so that's exactly how we built the fashion brand, which is very unique. And well, yeah, so what was the lead? Like, if you had an idea, how long did it take to have the garment in hand after that idea? I mean, it changes. It fluctuates, depends on what it is, but it could be two weeks. To, oh, for a sample or the production? Both. I mean, you could do a sample in a few days. But then let's say, so what's the process? So you have an idea. You sketch, have a sketch it. Yeah. You have an idea. You have a sketch. Um, you give it to a pattern maker. They create a pattern, which is like a two-dimensional version of it, either in paper or on the computer. Mm-hmm. You print it out if it's on the computer. You lay it on top of fabric. You cut it out. You give it to a seamstress who then sews it up according to the like instructions. And you would have these folks working for you at REF? Yes. And they'd make a sample, and then and then someone would model it. Then you try it on a fit model. You try it on a fit model. Yeah. So as soon as the sample is done, you put it on the fit model. You make modifications. The pattern maker goes and makes modifications to the paper or computer yeah. sample. It gets sewn up again. Yeah. And then you might fit again, and you might say, this is perfect. And so if it's great, then what do you do? It goes to a production pattern maker, who then like does some necessary changes to make it ready for, for production. So if I understand correctly, a pattern is, if I take a giant sheet of fabric, what pieces do I need to make yes. a piece of clothing? To make a th- to, how do I make two-dimensional fabric mm. three-dimensional? Right. And so like a pattern often looks like a schematic. It, it's like an out, outline panels of clothing. Exactly. And like some things that you would do is like you have software that goes and creates the best yield. Right. So how do you combine all the puzzle pieces yes. of something, all the sizes too, to make it, utilize the fabric the best. Let's go back to your thing about the dress question because I didn't do a good job answering it. I can do a better job. The reason why the ref dress is like, like women love it so much Mm. is because it's actually what they want. So it's just, it's just million, I don't know if it's millions, it could be millions of iterations on different Mm. dress types that women have told us they liked. Oh, you like, you like it to fit like this? Oh, you like this length? Oh, you like this type of sleeve? Oh, you like this? And so it's literally just like an amalgamation of all the different... So you're saying that the ref dress is like an optimization function on what women want. Yes, 100%. In a dress. It's not yes. some like stroke of no, genius. I'm, I'm, that, not a, I'm not a design genius at all. Mm. I'm an imitator. <laughs> I'm like really good at picking up on trends and I'm really good at the merchandising math. It's interesting because... To me, ref is so effortless feeling. Yes. Like the clothing, the brand. Yes. So how do you strike that, right? Because when I think data and optimization, I don't think sort of careless. I don't think chill. 
but that's the vibe I get. So how did you, how did you do that? How did you pair this kind of low key feeling with intelligence, like under the hood that's driving the strategy? I love contradictions. Mm. I like that. I like the push and pull of opposites. So it's like when we started RAF, the PR people would say like, we can't talk about sustainable fashion. Like nobody wants to hear about that. Mm. Sustainability is nerdy and not cool. It was, I mean, now it's a different story, but back then it was very pashik. Mm. And so I wrote a list of all the things that were, that was how people viewed sustainability. So earnest, uh, wordy, mm. I don't know, nerdy, mm. granola, all these words that actually were very like, kind of like Patagonia at the time. Again, Patagonia is cool now. And then I said, okay, the ref brand is going to be the exact opposite of huh. all these things. It's going to be, so it's not going to be earnest. We're going to be sarcastic mm. and we're going to be sexy because we're going to, that's, I figured the opposite of granola. And so it was a very like calculated move to make mm. reformation effortless and chill. So that idea of the contrast was that a data-informed idea or is that just your intuition that like contrasts are compelling? Contrasts are compelling and contrast change consumers' viewpoints mm. about things. So that was sort of looking at how did fashion brands and brands in the past change the way, change like tightly held beliefs that consumers had about things. And one was denim. So like the mm. idea that denim used to be this like blue collar thing that people didn't want to wear, mm. not cool, not fashionable. And Calvin Klein, you know, put it on Brooke Shields, who was like a sort of probably too young, especially by today's standards, models, took her top off and she did sexy poses and poof, like jeans are sexy now mm. and still remain sexy. And I'm wearing them today. Mm. But you're saying that... I looked at different examples of how people changed perception. And what you found was that contrast was at the core or doing things in an unexpected way contrast was at the core doing things in an unexpected way and sort of owning it like you don't say jeans are cool now right which is like so annoying because i feel like all the ddc brands do that they're right. like here is an example of right. what we are yeah. we're gonna write a business you know case of what we are and put yeah. it on our homepage. and i think that marketing should be like under the hood and sexy and mm. like what you don't say. And so it's sort of like, I never wanted to say sustainability is sexy. We just were sexy. And then people were like, what? Mm. If you think about what cool has looked like, what we think about as cool, it's always effortless. Uh, it always seems effortless. It always seems irreverent, you know, but that's often extremely effortful under the hood. Yeah. But it's not saying it, right? Yeah. You can't say I'm so cool. You just are cool. So you're saying that you made this list of things that sustainability was, and you were going to be the anti, the anti that. And I actually think, you know, we talk about at universe this idea of like tension, right? Like people think, oh, if I'm going to brand something, I want it to be consistent. I want there to be a singular idea. But that's forgettable. Like you don't, it doesn't stick. It doesn't catch you in your tracks. And like actually unexpected pairings of things, things that are contradictory, you know, get you to, to stop. Like for us, when we think about our brand, there's really like two halves of it. There's the clean utility oriented tool. And then there's the person who uses it, which is an artist, a creator, someone who's exuberant and imaginative. And so you have this pairing of like, the simple Dita Ram style, like functional Swiss tool coupled with this kind of acid soaked, you know, psychedelic thing. And that tension is interesting. This like hippie techno, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm hearing from you. It's like that, that, that tension, you know, was there a way that you tested it early on just to validate that? I don't like to test everything. Mm. I think certain things are, especially around brand, like how are you mm. going to test brand stuff? Mm. You know, it's always like when you're in the room and they're like, what's the ROI on that? You're mm. like, I don't know. You right. know what I mean? It's a party. But yeah, so the, the, <laughs> it's funny that you say that because you're also saying that you're very data-driven. So yes. what's, the, what's the nuance there that you're cutting? You can't count things sometimes. Mm. Like, and trying to count things sometimes is just silly. 
There's certain like, things that are countable and certain things that like are what's, not. Like what's what's not countable and what's countable? Certain things with brand are not countable. Like what? Um, like, I don't know. Like that. Like how to create your brand. I think that's more of like an intuitive vibe of like what you're saying is is what is interesting, right? Mm. And like what is sticky. Mm. It's like, I think about that in terms of a person, right? Mm. So it's like, I don't like people that are boring. Mm. Like you're exactly who you should be down to the T, like a, like a, prototype and people think like that's what brands should be right like I stand for this and that's the only thing that I can stand for but I equate it to people and I would find that person boring and uninteresting right I want a person that surprises me that is has depth and so I think the same thing about Mm. brands I don't know how you test that like I guess well I think so what you're saying is complexity complexity creates character it's what creates intrigue and ultimately what creates change, right? Yes. Like it's that interaction of unexpected things. Yes. Like a complex person is someone who's interested in in many things and in some ways has many contradictions that don't add up. And that's what makes them compelling. Yes. So for a brand, you see the same thing. And the way I, I think about that is like, the question is when do you test, right? Because if you're in the ideation period where you're conceiving of something, it's like that thing needs to gestate before you like, test it or bring it to market. But at a certain point, it is coherent. It is an idea. And you want to see how people react. And then you're sort of adjusting it. Is that how you think about? So I don't, I I guess like, I think you have your brand core values and you build out your brand Mm. and that should kind of live. Mm. Don't know how you test that. So you think testing is more on product? Yes. That's what I'm saying. Mm. I think testing is more on product. I think even you, when you can do testing on paid marketing, that really works. Right. But, but again, that's like a marketing product. Mm. And like there definitely are marketing products mm. that you can test, right? Like a catalog that you mail to people. You know, influencer marketing, codes. Like those are things you can test. One of the themes of this podcast, the reason I wanted to create it is because I think we need like more positive visions of the future and new visions, and diverse visions. And I think the art of making a vision a reality is this like kind of divine thing. It's this, you're, you're taking this idea in your mind that doesn't exist and bringing it into the world, creating a reality out of a fiction. And some ideas are stories and we, we write about them and we make pictures. Some of them are businesses and then become movements and then employ many people and, you know, ship products all over the world. And I think that uh, to me, like the art of manifesting a vision is really about how do you fit that vision to the world in some sense. And so there are motivations. There's a reason why you start this company. Like you want to build a fashion company that is Mm eco-friendly, that's responsible, that's taking care of the planet. Um, Like that's just a value that you have. You believe that should exist. You have this sensibility around the kind of brand. And that's like a matter of, in a way, expression. You you want to share that. But then there is, how do I get the world to want that? And so that's this kind of fitting of the vision to the world. And so you're sort of making millions of micro adjustments to sort of home in on it. It's like, you know directionally where you want to go from the outset, but you don't even know the exact path. So, yeah, what was that process like for you? Like, what were some of the things that you were wrong about in the beginning that you sort of found your way with? So I think that's a really good way to articulate it. Because it's like, when I came up with the idea to do the sustainable fashion brand, if I would have tested it, it would have tested as don't do it, right? (laughs) So I think there's certain times where you... You can't test it. You have an idea, you have a vision of what you think should exist, and you have to kind of almost guide everybody Mm. else towards that idea. Mm. I wanted to be more out loud about the climate problem in the Mm. beginning. And I would, you know, build these campaigns and marketing ideas. And luckily I was surrounded by some smarter people that said, Mm. nobody wants to hear this shit. This is like fucking depressing. Like, no, that's not how to get people like And uh, I was also very, I was really good in the beginning at finding smart people in marketing and branding Mm. and like making them talk to me, you know? So there was these very formative conversations that I had and that really shaped. Like, is there anyone that comes to mind? Yeah, but I don't want to say. But what's something you learned from them? Well, that was just that, like not to be a bummer, Mm. you know, that like being a climate change bummer is not fashionable and nobody's going to want to be a part of that. So how do you think about like 
when I think about positivity, I often think of like pretty kind of lame things. Like there's a very fine line between being positive and being sort of campy or just cheesy. Mm. How do you think about making like a optimistic future sexy? For me, it's sarcasm, Mm. blatant sexiness, Mm. right? Like if something's blatantly sexy, it's sort of, and I think sexy stuff that's a little bit more edgy. Mm. I mean, that's my personal sexy brand. (laughs) Yeah. Where's the line though between like cynicism and sarcasm? Like, because, you know, I think, I think actually a lot of the, the negativity about the future comes from like just a deep cynicism. I think what you do is you say something positive sarcastically. Mm. You know, like make a joke about the positive thing you're saying. Like, is there something that comes to mind? I think there was some, we did a campaign of uh, saving water. Mm. <laughs> it's really nasty, but mm-hmm. we did a campaign of saving water. I'm so embarrassed. I'm like, can't believe I'm blushing as I'm about to say this. Mm. And we said, we like it wet or I'm wet. <laughs> And it was funny, you know, because we were talking, it's like a very nerdy thing of, you know, these genes save 1,000 gallons of water more than the other genes. And like, you know, we would say that. And then in the next sentence say, we like it wet. Like a sexy girl saying that. By the way, that's less sarcasm to me than just humor. Sure. That's humor and sex. Yeah. Humor and sex. Humor and sex together. That's how we save the world. I I mean, I think that's my, you know, that's been my toolkit. That's such an interesting point, right? Like, because... I feel like most industries that are working in the future don't think about either of those things, humor or sex. (laughs) Right, because the future is humorless and sexless. (laughs) That's how all the, right? (laughs) All right, that's dystopian, right? So I think that gets to the heart of it. I even think, by the way, and I was checking out some of these solar punk images, and I love the idea even more before I saw the pictures of what it meant. Because the pictures... Or almost fairy tale like they don't have that kind of grit, that kind of like edge in a way that makes it feel real. Mm-hmm. Do you think you know how much is like geography influence you, like New York versus LA, and how, like how how has that maybe shaped your your aesthetic ideas? Well, I personally don't like LA. Yeah, why? I'm not, yeah, it's you're not, from LA. It's, it's not for me. That's yeah. not a thing. Yeah. I actually like LA. It's not for me. Yeah. How much has LA shaped my aesthetic versus or, New York? Yeah, or like, has there been a place that's affected how you? I love New York. You, I love it. What do you love about it? I love the people. I love the immediacy. Mm. I'm sort of lazy. I'm a lazy. I can be lazy, and New York lets you be that way because you don't have to mm. make a plan. You mm. can just kind of mm. walk outside, and everything's there for you. I think it's the people too. I just love the people here. When you talk about like getting ideas and getting data to create new things, like how much of that is driven by you know people you're seeing on the street, or is it? It used to be people on the street, right? Yeah. Now I'm like a mom, and yeah. I'm not out and about all the time. But it used to be I was out and about all the time, looking at what people wear. Yeah, I'm, and I said I'm a big imitator. It's a perfect example. Wednesday night, I was at like a fashion dinner, yeah. and I saw this woman wearing this amazing outfit, and I literally. Friday night was my husband's birthday and I made the same exact look on myself. Mm. Sort of a shameless imitator. Well, it's a great artist steal. I don't even know if I was stealing. I just was sort of like, that is so cool. She wore a men's suit and like, you saw, you were at the birthday party, like a man's suit and like very like kind of, um, it was very 80s look and I loved it. So I guess that's also, I feel like that specific example is another like contrast, right? So I think- yeah. You know, it sounds like also in even just composing a look, contrast. Yeah, I like it. Work. Yes. I think about like dialectics a lot because the way my brain works is it's like, I can look at a situation and say, oh, like there's two poles here. There's like this and that. There's, do I go for for this option or that option? And I get really stuck because I'm usually, usually pretty decisive, but there's sometimes where you're like, you know, what happens here? This or that. And I like to say that like when confronted with an either or and you're really wrestling with it, the, a- the answers usually end. It's usually both. Um, mm. And I think what I'm hearing from you is like, yeah, like you can't, and that's complexity, right? It's, it's layering those things in. Mm-hmm. I love it. So you were saying, I want to cut back to a couple of things. One is just the process of making clothing because mm-hmm. um, we left it off at like production pattern. And then I want to hear a little bit more about the, the Reformation journey. How did it go from a store to an empire? 
Imagine listening to a podcast and not hearing an ad for a website builder. You'd be like, what kind of podcast is this? We know you need your fix and we're not gonna deprive you of that. At Universe, we believe websites are the main event. So of course we'd sandwich one in between our show. Here's the deal. Websites are dope, everyone needs one, and they can actually be fun to build and have some personality behind them. This is the part of the ad where I rattle off a list of all the things our website building product can do for you in hopes that you choose Universe over the competition. Create sites, build stores, analytics, email shipping off from your phone feels like playing with Legos, all that good stuff. We got it. I mean, you can make sites so good you'll shit yourself, but that's just brass tacks. At Universe, a website is so much more than just something you hear about on a podcast commercial. It's an extension of self. It's a way to interact creatively with the digital world. And we're hell-bent on helping the internet live up to its full potential. A more eclectic, more electric place. Because the internet shouldn't just be a space for squares. Grab a domain like .xyz and show those .com boomers what the internet's all about. Head to Universe. That's universe.se, but the dot is silent. Punch those puppies into the app store, my friend, and we'll see you out there. So you've got this production pattern. The machine helps you figure out the, the best yield of that fabric. What happens then? So the production pattern maker goes and makes the garment production ready. Things that will make it easier to sew for lots of people, like adjustments for um, cost purposes. Then the computer will create multiple sizes. Mm. And then you will tell the computer, the computer, you tell Hal how much um, of you want, how much you want of each size. And then it creates like a perfect thing called a marker, which mm. is basically like, you have these really, really long tables and you lay out the fabric on these really long tables and then you have these paper markers that sort of have every single piece and every single size in the exact ratio you need to create the exact amount you want. So you can stack the fabric hmm. so you know how many layers of fabric to stack. Then you put the paper on top and it will yield out the exact amount of units that you want. Those come out, they get bundled. Is each layer one garment? No, each layer is just a fabric, right? Because right. it's... It could be, I don't know how long. This is another thing, dates yeah. and lengths. But let's just say it's a 25-foot table. And the I fabric see. just goes one way, and then it comes back. Yeah. And one way, and then it comes back. Huh. Then they put the paper on top. And then they have these like gigantic kind of like chainsaw things. But right. they're more cutters. And they cut out the shapes, mm. the two-dimensional shapes. Yeah. Who, where was the stuff being produced back in the-, in the we always, Yeah, we made it in our own factory. So you had a factory- Yes. In LA. Yes, we always had our own factory. We still have our own factory. And you have like a machine that does this cutting in, in-house. Yes. So, and the and the quantities that you're making at this point, like how many units are you making? So first, you know, they're getting cut by hand with scissors, uh, like back in the day. And then you're like, okay, you know what? We're really doing well. At we what should. point do you go from scissors cutting a pattern to like how many units do you need to be making for it to make sense to to do it with a machine? God, I don't remember. Yeah. Maybe like 50, 20. Got it. Something like that. So now you've got the pieces of the clothing made and then someone sews it up. So and- you, you 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 bundle them. Yeah. And by size, generally. And then you give them to like a, a team, like a sewing team. Mm. And they kind of figure out how they're going to make this garment. Mm. So they'll be like, this person just does, let's say it's a jean. This person just does waistbands. This person just does inseams. This person just does outseams. This person does hems. This person, you know, connects everything together. So you take the pieces. Forgot that. Continue. What's that thing you just said? Kaizen. Kaizen. Yeah. Yeah. They Kaizen it up. So like they they get a finished, what, what it should look like when it's finished. They get a kit of parts and then... Their task is like, how do we make this in a repeatable way? Yes. And so most efficiently. Divide and conquer. Like yes. someone's doing one part. But because you have so many different products, you actually have to be pretty limp, nimble. Like if you're building cars, there's a couple models. In in your world, you have many, many different products. That's like the big problem for us is that because we're so Reformation is built on um, smaller units, but like a, a ton of different style so it's not very you don't really get that good at any particular mm. style good as in like good at making them efficiency efficiency yeah oh. economies of scale because even though you're making lots of things they're all different there's certain things you get good at but generally no and efficiency is just it takes more time 
yes, to, like, to make a thing. Like there are factories that make t-shirts that are just so good at making the same t-shirt over right. and over again. It's the same thing like the car, yeah. you know, and they'll be like, we make a t-shirt in 28 seconds, right. you know, and like we were never like that. So how long does it take or did it take to go from idea to like unit that you could sell? It just depends how hard you want to prioritize it, right? Because everything's, mm-hmm. there's a line. So what's the, what's the, what's the range? Raf can do it in two weeks now. From yeah. idea to item in a store. I think, yeah, I think so. And then- uh, uh, We could do it in two weeks before. And, and what's the normal range? 12 months. For ref, like what would be, if the lower bound was two weeks, what's the upper bound? It's Just like depends. Six like months. if you're doing a sweater, like you make the sweater in in China or something, mm. you know, that's your, you're at their whim as far as what their lead times are. So that could be like nine months. But for you- Something that's getting made in the ref factory, like they're also getting, ref's getting really good at making stuff in- other people's factories hmm. and quickly. So though, I guess the, the point I'm getting at is- What's the if, average time it takes them to get something in store? In the world of the, the sort of rapid iteration, was it like, is it like- I can't remember exactly, but, but maybe but, it's 60 days, 55 cool. days, something so like that. So what you're describing, I, I've thought of as like fast fashion. It is fast is fashion. The idea that you can be very responsive to the market and learn and just put in more iterations. And obviously Zara is the- sort of king of fast fashion, but yes. I think, and, and it was big when you had gotten started. So how do you think about Zara and like, where were you different? And also people don't really think of that as sustainable. They think of it as the opposite. So I'm curious how you think about that. Raf doesn't really like the word fast fashion mm-hmm. anymore. They don't use it. I kind of like it. <laughs> Again, because I like that idea of contrast, right. like sustainable fast fashion just feels so mm. wrong in your head mm. that I like it. Mm. But um, it is, it's, we're, you know, Raf is very good at making clothes very quickly. Um, and how do I think about Zara? I, I think they're great. Like, I think they're amazing. They're but not like, sustainable, well, but... Yeah. So what was the difference, though, that you were cutting with Zara, right? I think that we're Zara with a soul. What do you mean? Zara doesn't really have much of a brand or a soul or a mission. It's just imitation. This is sort of like, it's imitation, but they're logistically very strong. They're very good at making clothes that people want to wear. Like, they have a lot of strengths, but I don't think brand or mission... Is one of them. But like, if I think about it, wh- what I'm hearing from you is like Zara is like a data machine. It knows. Oh, yes. Amazing. So where do you think, but you also say that you, you know, you're guided in many ways by it. So like, wh- what's the difference there? I guess just scale. Hopefully we'll be mm. at Zara one day. Mm. Okay. So I think we met in 2011 mm-hmm. or uh, yeah, 2011 or 12. <laughs> and uh, this is funny. 10 years. It's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah. I was very young. Yeah. I was 21. Such a weirdo that I was friends with you. I know. What was Ref at that point? I think we had the three stores. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out how to build an e-commerce business. And Mm. I was trying to figure out the internet. And what, like, why? Um, Like I said that, you know, saving up like the 500,000 to build a new store, I was like, this is moving too slowly. Mm. And... I had a friend in LA that had started like an e-commerce business that had exploded and I was very, I'm a very competitive person. I met one of the founders of Warby Parker mm. and this is like before, War, like when Warby was just getting started right. and I was like. This is before D2C was like a thing. There was no, there was, yeah. there was no D2C, you know, and I thought, okay, I need to meet one of these people called a venture capitalist right. and I'm going to meet a venture capitalist yeah. and they're going to give me money and then I'll figure out. And then that's what I need to start an e-commerce business. Mm. So I went to go try to raise capital and it was awful. I've got terrible offers. It was at the time when, you know, there was no such thing. Brick and mortar would die. There would be no more retail stores ever. <laughs> and um, we had three retail stores. Mm. I also didn't know any of the words. I remember being in a meeting and it was just, I, I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> Like, none of the words meant anything Mm. to me. And I got a really, I worked really hard on it, but I got a super shitty term sheet and I turned Mm. it down. And I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I walked, yes, I did. I walked and I got the term sheet that night. I like cried, ate a bunch of ice cream, and then came into the office the next day and told everybody that we were no longer the Reformation. We were the Mm Reformation.com and that they would focus all of their energy on e-commerce. And that's what I would do too. Mm. And that's what I did. I just literally... (laughs) That's all I did was think about how to build a e-commerce business. But like, was that because you wanted it to be big and this was the path for it? Yes. I knew that 
again, like I didn't want to be a merchant. I yeah. wanted to build a big business. I wanted to have a meaningful, like, again, I'm a very earnest person sometimes, but like I wanted to have a meaningful impact on the world. Right. I wanted to leave the world better than I found it. That's very important to me. So you were in this like transition state from more traditional, but in a new way, fashion stores, effectively. You were making your own products, so you're still direct to consumer, but you were selling in person. Yes. And then you wanted to transition it to be like a high-scale global internet business. I was just seeing this explosive growth on mm. e-commerce businesses, and I wanted to, I wanted in on it. Did you ever think, oh, like, could my product work in this context? Like dresses? Yeah, I knew it could. Yeah. I think one of the things that, you know, you really innovated on was the the product looked better in pictures than it did, like, in some ways in person. <laughs> I, yeah. I just remember seeing the product in per like, seeing it, photos of, of the dresses on models and, and seeing them in a store. And, like, obviously they look great in a store, but, like. Yes, they looked, they do look better on the models. Because well, it's, it like, editorial. It was, a, was that 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 we figured that out. What do you mean? I didn't tell you this story? No. So um, so I said, okay, we're the reformation.com. I I stopped outsourcing the photo shoots. I started doing like every single thing myself, like the mm. photo shoots, picking the models, styling them, like doing, you know, picking the makeup. And I had done a photo shoot and I am not a I am administratively challenged and I had forgotten to shoot one dress and it was like an important dress, but we had put it in what's called like the editorial photo shoot, which is sort of the photo shoot that's more right. you put on the homepage, not the product right. image. And I was like, fuck it, use the editorial image, just crop it and put it in. And they're like, it doesn't, it's totally different. It doesn't work, you know, because back in those days, product images were plain images right. of the products, no face or maybe a face standing forward on a white background, front, side, back, yeah. boom. I put the editorial image in and we put it up and it sold like hotcakes mm. in I, the, the editorial image. And, and we were selling literally like three things a day mm. at that time, like on the whole site, three, four wow. things a day. And this thing sold 12 in a day. And that's like sort of, I thought, uh-huh, mm. amazing. Like, okay, I get it. This is what you want? The next shoot was literally the whole shoot. All the products look like that. And we changed the whole site to look like that. Mm. And that was that was actually the, like, the beginning of the hockey stick for Ref. Huh. Wow. So I feel like when, when I had first come across it and you were still in person, or like mostly brick and mortar, there was definitely like a cult following. You had like... There was clearly something that was really resonating. Yes. But then I feel like at that point, you also, as you went online, it wasn't just that you were selling online, but you were marketing online. Um, and not marketing in like the traditional sense of ads, but like your email newsletters were like this really cool thing. That, and you do drops on a, like a weekly basis and you had this really great copy and amazing photography. And then you built a social presence. So talk a little bit about, yeah, your approach there and how you thought about marketing. So with newsletters, my approach is, is I look at the top performers, like who are best in class. So for newsletters, I would say, who's best in class in newsletters? Mm -hmm. And I would say, these three people in fashion are best in class in newsletters. And then I would look at their newsletters and I would dissect them. Mm -hmm. What makes them good? What makes them, and what, how do they do this? How do they approach this? And then I would go, where are their opportunities? You mm -hmm. know, and so I take, you know, it's pretty basic. I take the best of the best in class things, say, what, what do I want to keep? And then what do I want to add on? And so what I noticed is, is like, I really like the formats. I like the way that they group things by stories. Like, okay, you know, at the time it was like a big moment for us was Coachella. Like we should do, you know, let's do a Coachella story. They're talking about things that women want to do in their lives at that moment. That's really good. Okay, mm. let's do that. What are they doing really bad? Okay, their copy is awful. Like I thought, this is terrible. Like mm. I hate a shop now button. I still like, mm. I find it cringe. Mm. And so I said, here's a really big opportunity. Why are people so uncomfortably salesy? Like it almost felt like the 1950s ads in newsletters. Mm. You know, like how in the 1950s you'd be like, here is a product, please buy. Yes. And <laughs> that's what it felt like to me. And so I thought that was like a big opportunity. There's a reason why people ha have a shop now button on their newsletters, right? Because like that probably, it's 
first of all, obvious, or like that, that's the, what the first idea that comes up is. And then the way that people run these is they are testing them. And so then they're running like tests against different copy on that treatment, but they're starting with the same idea. And I feel like it requires a bit of like bravery or courage to not put it there in the first place. Like you're taking a little bit of a leap of faith by doing the non-obvious thing. I also think there's like this thing with like product testing with A-B testing where, okay, yeah, maybe you get like a 2% incremental lift of people clicking on the shop now, but what, what is the, like, what does it do to brand? Mm. And like, what's the, how does it depreciate the brand mm. and like make people just not want to subscribe to your newsletters at all? Like you can't measure that. Mm. I mean, you know? Yeah, of course. You keep adding things, of course they're going to perform like all the different, right. and then, but then it just becomes like a crowded mess. Yeah. I think, you know, your gift in a lot of ways is being able to juggle that intuition and the data. Thank you. And I'm trying to get to like how you'd articulate that, but it really sounds like there are a set of things that you're protective over and have a lot of confidence in, which is like brand values, style, maybe mission. But there are a lot of other things that you're willing to not just compromise on, but really travel based on what you learn. Yes. I mean, and sometimes I, I, you know, there's been times where like ref has a no promotions rule, but there's Mm. been times where we really needed the revenue and like, yeah, you do it. Yeah. But you come back to center. Right. So what's the sort of short story from, you know, going from this brick and mortar, you know, business to explosive online business, like how did it happen? And you know, what was the general right away? So as soon as we started, as soon as we crafted like the online strategy, the sales strategy, Mm -hmm. the marketing strategy and the brand strategy for online, it was immediate. So we came up with a newsletter strategy. We were very lucky to be at the beginning of Instagram. We came up with an Instagram Mm -hmm. strategy and then we came up with a product strategy. And how did you scale? Like, how did you scale operationally? Like how did you? It was very difficult. What was the hardest part? All of them. All the parts were hard. Okay, let's talk about production. How did you go from making 25 units to making a couple hundred units? It was very hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had to, we had to fly, I had to fly to LA. I grew up there. Yeah. So you I was were living, living in New York. York. Yeah. I flew, I didn't know how to set up a factory here. I kept trying. I kept trying to build relationships with factories. It was very challenging. And so I went to LA because I knew I had relationships yeah. there um, and I built a factory there. How did you know how to build a factory? I had these really great, like, it started off with, there was a woman that was my production pattern maker, Lupe, she's mm. the best. And she had like her own little shop with like seven people and they would do like little runs. Mm. And I was like, how about you come and you come and I, you know, sort of like, I don't know, aqua hire you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you come on board. Yeah. And so we started there and it was literally like, I swear the first factory was all her family. Like it was literally, they were all related. And so they really built, I did not know what I was Mm. doing. They built the factory. And it was, and I had, I had a good relationship with them. I I speak, I speak decent Spanish and, you know, we really built it together. What do you need? Okay. Can you do this for me? I really need this by Friday. This is the most important piece. They did it. Mm. So I feel like a a big part of, the ref success story again was this sort of editorial quality. Mm-hmm. And I know, you know, that Lud, your Ludwig, your husband, works at Ref still. Mm. How involved was he in in sort of shaping the brand? He was super involved. Yeah. And in what way? He's sort of, he's the uh, like the graphic design, like the way that it looks. Yeah. He was also very good at um, he's very good at towing the line. He's like very elitist. Yes. More so than me. Like, mm. I'll be like, let's do the promo. Right. Like, and he's like, no. You know, he's mm. very like, he's rigid, more rigid mm. than I am. Mm. And yeah, he does, he's great at brand. Like, mm. he's really excellent at it. So it was really our relationship, like us together doing it. Yeah, because I don't think of Lud as like a data-driven person. No. Right, so that's- But he's actually very good at math. Mm. He's no, very good know, at math, uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to pay attention to that when he makes decisions right. about creative. He's very intuitive. He's very intuitive. He's a stereotypical creative. Yeah. Yeah. So I know Lud and he, you know, I think a lot of the, it's funny because he's Swedish, but a lot of the ref brand was words. It's copy. Um, and he writes it. And he writes it. Yes. We would write it together, but he writes it. He still writes, he still writes some of it. Yeah. He was telling me that he's like reviewing 
you know, like a spreadsheet of the social posts and you know everything that's going out. So cute. I think, how do you think about copy? And like, I feel like words in general are not appreciated as, as much as they could be. I love it. I love copy. I didn't even know I was like, I didn't even know I loved copy till this, like building Raph as a digital brand, mm. like unlocked a lot of creativity in me that I did not know I had. Mm. Like I didn't know I wrote, I wrote, but I started writing copy mm. and like I would, do photo shoots, like creative direct photo shoots, things I never did before, but I remember, that I loved. Yeah, and I remember um, I was visiting your factory and like studio in LA mm -hmm. in 2013. And I think you were either creative directing a photo shoot or like a fit model thing. Um, yeah, like how much of that work do you love? So I haven't done it in a few years now, mm -hmm. so it's actually a really good, now I can really reflect and say what I love. I think I love, like, I miss sketching clothes and fitting them. Mm. I don't miss photo shoots at all. Mm. Um, I like writing copy. I still like writing copy. Why do you not miss the photo shoots? They're very repetitive. Mm. <laughs> it's very repetitive. It's like you're kind of thrust into, I mean, I'm such an asshole right now. You're thrust into a room with a bunch of people. You don't really know who they are. And you're sort yeah. of like subject, oh my God, I'm being such an asshole. Okay. You are subjected to their personality for 12 hours. Mm. And so I think maybe if I got to work on photo shoots where it was with the same people right. and, and you know, and I'm, sometimes you just like spend 12 hours with somebody. You're just like, what the, f this is a terrible, and you just, you're on your feet all day. The fla it's like flashing lights. Yeah. So what was it like for you, like scaling as a CEO? It was very hard for me. What, what was the hardest part or what was a hard part? I just was, I was super stressed out because mm. there was so much going on. Mm. I didn't have, we didn't really have funding in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I had to manage a ton of financial stuff. Yeah. I had to manage my ego. Like I was just hell bent on making Rafa's success, like at all costs. Mm -hmm. I think it was just, I had never managed people like on mm. that scale before. So that was really challenging for me and just like learning as I went. So I had mm. to keep learning as I went. Yeah. I think those things, and it was very, it was challenging. Yeah. I loved it though. There was a lot of parts that I loved. Yeah. Did you, uh, how, do you have self doubt? Like, is self doubt a part, a challenge yes. for you? Yes. And what's that like? Like, what's that inner monologue? I can just be really, really hard on myself. In the sense that, like, like what's an example of that? Like sending an email, mm. you know, self-doubt around sending email. Just fucking hit send. Like, Send don't, the damn email. Send the fucking email. Like yeah. that's actually a lesson I've learned in the past. I think I'm 45. It's the past year I've learned. It's just send it. Yeah. So I think that's been- And I mean, is that like an email to an investor or to- yeah, like I'm not like crippled. It would be yeah. like a super important email. How am I going to handle it? Mm. Or, you know, it's also like- I think I can be quite, uh, my natural state is very like, not, I'm not going to say gruff. I'm going to say direct. And I think perhaps also like the industry I was in is not a direct mm. industry. Mm. It's more like more exclamation points. Yeah. So I think it's also like a question of fit. Yeah. What was it like, you know, fashion is, there are more women in fashion than in other industries, but yes. what was it like as a female CEO, especially one who raised venture capital, which is, you know, and at the time was dominated uh, by men. Still like, dominated. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like? Like I said, so at first I had no idea what anybody was talking about. Mm. Um, and then I learned. So I learned, I, I picked it up as I went and you, Joe, were very helpful. Joe was probably my lead instructor and in what everybody yeah. was talking about. Um, I'm a good learner. I, I picked things up. And I picked it up. You know, I would say the venture community is probably easier with women than the private equity community mm. and the debt community, especially. Mm. It was hard though, you know, sometimes you're, they would say things like, there was like another business at the time called Nasty Gal and they sold, like we sold dresses for $250 and they probably sold clothes for $75. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the investors would say things like, well, if there's a Nasty Gal, why does there need to be a reformation? Right. I'm like, I don't know. Why does there need to be a Mercedes-Benz if there's a Honda? Like, we're right. not even selling the same, you know what I mean? Yeah. So just dumb questions like that. And, you know, they would always say, oh, my daughter likes your dresses. Or, you know, my wife does. You know, they always bring their their daughters or wives into the conversations. Mm -hmm. Like, do, do you always talk about, like, mm -hmm. your daughter at your IC meeting? Like, right. 
So it's just like sort of stuff like that. You just, that's like small. I mean, it's not bad. I think at first I didn't know how to do it, but I learned. And then as I got better at it, it was easier. I definitely, I never called people out. There was one debt conversation where I was talking to lenders. I needed a like a line of credit. And it was such an awful conversation. They were so just awful yeah. that I did call them out after. I mm. called them up and I let them know that I felt that the that the meeting had not gone well and I felt that they had treated me differently because And how did that go? They were so apologetic. Yeah. You know, and I did it in a professional way. That's the only time I ever did it. We raised the private equity round in 2019 multiple times, but only when Okay, so we we had to pitch, I don't know, 10, 15, 16 times. And at the other side of the table, let's say it was a PE firm or strategic or whatever, mm-hmm. if the woman was in charge, every time there was the woman was the lead investor on the other side, like mm-hmm. she was the most senior person, she would always say, this is the only time in my 20 years that mm-hmm. I have ever seen an all-female team pitching. Wow. And I was like, and I definitely felt like, fuck, should we get a dude should we like find a dude just to pitch? Because it's like we're three women, you know? And I I definitely had conversations where we thought like we need at least one guy on this side. It looks like, will they yeah. treat us fairly? But you didn't do that. No, it was too busy. Too, <laughs> it was too busy running the business and be, making a pitch deck. You know, I think ultimately like what helps ideas come into the world are among many things like technology right? Technology helps us manifest ideas, but also capital. And capital is upstream of tech, right? Like mm-hmm. if you have the, the capital, you can even invent the tech in, in, a, in a lot of ways. But so when you have people who allo- allocate capital who are homogenous, whether by gender or ethnicity or yeah. location, it limits the ideas that can come out because they're going to inherently be biased towards things they're more familiar with. Yes. I don't think it's malicious. Yeah. So how do you think about that now? Because I know you do some investing, you're incubating some new projects. Like, how do you think about, you know, there are so many ideas that don't see the light of day. And part of that is because they don't have access to the capital. How do you think about changing that? And, you know, yeah. I just think you need more women writing the checks. Mm. I think that it's like, there's just not enough women making the decisions. And is that women working at VC firms or is it they're writing their own checks out of their own I think it's across the board. Yeah. I I think it's across the board. I don't think, I'm not like, to go back to your earlier question, like, I'm very good at ignoring cultural cues. Like, mm. I would say that's one of my best guesses. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, if there's a room and everybody's discounting me because I'm a woman, I don't really mm. notice too much. And mm. it's probably also why, like, I'm not the best CEO because, mm. like, I'm not the best at reading a room. Mm. I'm just, like, gung-ho on doing what I'm going to do. Mm. And so, for me, raising capital, building a business, being a female entrepreneur, to be honest, was not that hard mm. because I just don't give a shit. On that level. I right. don't notice. I don't stop to notice. Your antenna wasn't picking it up every I don't detail. stop to notice. Mm. You know, I'm like sort of, I mean, you know this about me. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I want to do. I'm doing it. Right. You know, if it's egregious, I'll kind of notice, yeah. I think. But you are sensitive. It's just that you're not sensitive to... I'm, bad, I'm more sensitive on a one-on-one mm. or in a smaller setting, but in a group setting, mm. especially when I'm sitting in that room and I'm there like... I am here to get a check. You're on a mission. I'm on a mission. I'm going to do that. And yeah, there's going to be difficulties or, you know, maybe I'm being discounted or, you know, I've even had situations where like the investor's hitting on me. I'm like, Mm. you know what? Fine. Like, (laughs) (laughs) moving on. Yeah. I'm not going to let it stop me. Mm. Like, I'm very, I don't pay attention to obstacles. Mm. I think, but I think not all people are like that. And so I think that the the issue is, is you have to get more money into the hands of women. Like, I think the wealth gap with women is a bigger issue. And then confidence. Like, I think women sometimes lack the confidence to put themselves forward when they are probably the best suited person for the role or actually have a really great idea. And so that's what I try to focus on now in my, in my new work. So quick recap, you did Reformation <laughs> from... 2009 to 2019. And you really didn't, how much capital did you raise? You didn't raise that much capital. Can't remember, 20 something, 27? 27 million. Maybe. You know, you scaled it from zero to, you know, a very substantial business, but you didn't, you raised one or two rounds of capital. It wasn't, yeah. you know, and, and, and you had existed for several years without any outside capital. Yes. It's like three to five years. Yes. Would you recommend to someone who's starting a fashion company to think about, venture or 
Like, how would you recommend someone think about capital? I think it depends what kind of business they have. Or want? Yes. Yeah. So what what makes sense for capital? I think I think it's in vogue right now for everybody to raise capital, but mm. unless you have like a like an exit strategy, like people aren't going to want to give you capital. Mm. And like a typical fashion business does not have an exit strategy. Mm. Generally speaking. So it has to be something that somebody is going to want to acquire because the venture firm has to get their 10x. Right. So you sold a, a majority stake of the yes. business to private equity in 2019. Yes. And and then you stepped down as CEO. Yes. And you know, what was that process like for you? Which part? <laughs> Those are two different Both. parts. Okay, fine. Um, I was really ready to not be CEO anymore. Mm-hmm. And I was, I didn't pick private equity, but I knew I wanted to sell a majority stake in the business. Mm-hmm. It was sort of, I realized Would you have sold the whole business? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was a timing issue. Mm. So there, I realized that we were at a scale where it was sort of it, now or never to get somebody to buy us. Because if we got too much bigger, there would be a dearth of buyers. Mm-hmm. There's a sweet spot, right, mm-hmm. to get acquired. And I think it's important to think about that. And, and is that I a was, sweet spot in like revenue or valuation? I think it's a sweet spot in revenue and it's a sweet spot on EBITDA to make yourself mm-hmm. acquirable, delicious to, mm-hmm. delicious to investors. And I realized that we were kind of at the precipice. So I so I went and I did it. I had had another business before that suitors, and I was young and potential investors had come around and I hadn't sold it. And then I it had gone bankrupt in the first bubble, what was it, 2007, 2008 mm. bubble. Um, that fashion business went bankrupt. And I thought, I will never fucking make that mistake again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was nothing like losing all your money mm. to make you think about things differently. And so I realized I was like, I'm sitting on a golden egg and like, I am not going to f- make this mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very commercial. That's something yeah. about well, me. Well, I think, you know, one of the themes I'm interested in is like people think about it, that there's an inherent conflict between commerciality and creativity. But I actually think there's a tension, but exploring that tension is what actually lets you be more creative because you have capital, you can do things, you you know, like you have an engine that supports your imagination. How do you think about that? I don't even think about them as tension. Mm. I guess it is a little bit, right? Because you're like, get that promo off the the homepage. Why do you think people think about it as a tension or as a conflict? Because like you have like commercial people at businesses and Mm. then you have creative people at businesses and they fight over things. Like I think like there's companies like Apple, right? Like they're so seamless about it. Mm. I think they go together, right? Creativity should fuel commercialness, commerciality. Yeah, and vice versa in a way. Yes. So what have you been up to? I chill a lot. (laughs) I definitely did a lot of unwinding down and like I was a bit burnt out. So definitely a lot of winding down. And then now I do investing, which I find so boring. (laughs) Why do you do it? I still like it a little bit. You yeah. know, it's like fun to, I think it's fun to be exposed to um, to new businesses. And I there's definitely like, I meet founders mm. that I find very like energizing. Mm. But overall, I don't want to sit around all day and get pitched ideas mm-hmm. and decide whether they're good or not. I'm actually not even good at it. Like I have mm. no, I guess if somebody was pitching fashion businesses all day long, I would be good at it. But like I said, I don't think fashion businesses should be raising a ton mm. of venture um, I really like, so what I've started to do is incubate businesses. And mm-hmm. that I found is something that I really, really like doing. What what kinds of businesses? We just started um, a, like a creator influencer type of business, mm-hmm. technology business. And I love that one. And then the next one we want to start is a longevity business. So tell me about, about that. Tell me about the longevity business as much as it's a clear idea for you. I don't want to. All right, all right, all right. I don't what about the, uh, what about the influencer one? Okay, I'll talk about that one. I really feel like creators are the future and they're currently getting mm. screwed. Mm. And I think that there's going to be a big paradigm shift mm. in brands and creators and the way things happen. And I'm super into being a part of it. So what is this product though? The product is sort of like a business in a box for um, big influencers or bigger influencers to monetize, mm-hmm. to really kind of harness the power of their audiences. And I'm a little bit familiar with it. So a little bit. I'll summarize it as like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it is a way for someone who has maybe millions of followers to 
direct their followers to effectively a store that's under their own name, their own brand, but the products are not being sold by them. They're being sold by fashion companies, merchants, whatever, and then they get a cut of that. So, yes. um, And in a way, it's like instead of Facebook getting the ad revenue that a fashion brand would run, the influencers actually driving distribution for that retailer is you know getting getting that that spread is that right yes you are better at explaining it than i am what would you say to a you know up and coming fashion entrepreneur it just depends where you want to go mm. right so it's like i think what do you want to do do you want to sell it in 5 years do you, is this the business you want to own for the rest of your life right is this a passion project yeah. do you want to make lots of money i think people really need to think about what they want mm. I don't think I did that enough. And now when we're incubating businesses, I think we're very sure to articulate what we want yeah. with this business. So I love that because to me, I feel people don't in general think about what they want enough. Like knowing what you want is in some ways the most important thing because everything else then is downstream. It's like, okay, if I know what I want, I can go do that thing. But if you start doing a thing before you know what you want, it's very confusing. You're like, I don't know what the destination is. And I think like you're very good at that. Um, and I know that one of the things you do or have done is you make lists. Yes. Tell me about your lists. <laughs> um, I feel that people write dumb to-do lists. Yeah. Not that all, not to-do lists are dumb, but like you write a to-do list of like what you're going to do that day. And yeah. I like to write a to-do list of what I want to accomplish in the next 10 years mm. or 20 years. So I write lists like that. I want, I write my net worth. I write, you know, what I want for my family. And I'm, and, and, in a way that you would say is very contrasted, mm. I will intersperse like emotional family, mm. friends with finances. Is there like an example of something you'd have on the list? Yeah, I'd be like, I want a country house. Mm. I want a billion dollars. Mm. <laughs> like it's very much on my list. I want to, you know, people that know me well will be like, yo, I want to have a net worth of a billion. Why do you want that? I think there aren't enough female self-made billionaires. Yeah. I think that I'm not like very, I want to have money to affect the world the mm. way that I think it should be done. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really like good at influence. Mm. You know, I'm not going to be a politician. Mm. So you're saying control over influence. I I'm just better at money. Like, right. like uh, money is something that I am good at. Yes. And so, but I also have like, I'm very idealistic. And so I'd like to funnel that money towards things that I think are important. Like one example is um, closing the wealth gap yeah. with between men and women yeah. or um, positive solutions yeah. to affect climate change. So these, so you do these lists in like 10 year increments. Sure. Yeah. Is it like a rolling list? Like, do you update your lists? I had to update my list. When I sold Reformation, I had to you update my one. list. It took me a little while. I took some time off, but I had, I sort of like, after I sold Ref, I looked at the list and I had achieved everything on the list. And how long had that list been in the works that you were working against before? I think that was probably, might have been my first list, was the Reformation list. I probably wrote it when I was like 30, so 28, like a, 29. So like a 10 or 15 year list. It ended up being about 10 years to achieve it. So how did you have the idea to do the list? Probably Alcoholics Anonymous. Tell me more. <laughs> like when you're in AA, they make you write a lot. Journal, write lists, do all that stuff. Huh. I did that, a little bit of AA, and then a little bit of, um, they would call it like, there's also like in AA, they would do like a contrary, depending on who your sponsor is, like a contrary list. Like So like somebody, you might say like, here's all the terrible things I think about mm. myself. And then you would write all the nice things you think about you yourself. Were you in AA? Yes. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I was in AA. How old were you? I was sober from 18 to 21. Mm. And I was in AA probably for two years mm. at that point. And then I got sober again from 30 to 42. And I was in AA for the first four or five years of that. And also the artist way teaches you to write stuff like that. Mm. So, you know, people on the outside see successful entrepreneur, built this amazing company, really pioneering in so many ways, like as a female entrepreneur, but also in the work that you're doing, really one of a kind. And you also, your attitude is super positive, but you've had a lot of tough experiences. So like, and it sounds like even when you were really young, like yes. what, what happened and what was that like? And how did you recover? 
I sort of had like a tough childhood. Mm. So it wasn't like an easy childhood. Mm. And then um, when I was sort of like a year older, so I got to UC Berkeley at 17. And almost right away, I became, I developed a drug problem. So I did all kinds of drugs. And was that just an escape? I just was very like painfully shy as so like and in I was like very studious mm. but painfully shy, very insecure um and like very low self-confidence mm. and I just didn't like my parents just I feel bad I, they're never going to listen to this but <laughs> they just did not give me a good toolkit for life mm-hmm. like when you get stressed out like you know yeah. I had no toolkit mm. I would say I had no coping mechanisms and so getting high made me feel better. Like it made me be like not doubting myself or saying mean things to myself. And what happened? I did a lot of drugs from 17 to 21. And then it was dark. It was really dark. I did some dark, dark stuff. Um, And dropped out of college and dropped out of fashion school. And then at 21, I sort of, I remember I had this moment where I would, you know, when you close your eyes, you see things, like even Mm. if it's just lights and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I remember at 21, I closed my eyes and I didn't see anything. And it was Mm. really scary. I couldn't like imagine things or it was weird. Mm. There was nothing there. And then I got really scared. And an ex-boyfriend of mine was like, you know, do you want to go to AA with me? And Mm. I was like, okay. And then I went and then I got sober. And then I think AA therapy, artist way, reading like Buddhist stuff, like, Mm. you know, that all gave me the toolkit for the happy, positive person you see today. But you were like, it sounds like you were lost in a a lot of ways. Very lost. Very bad. But you seem very not lost now. So I'm curious, you know, we're all figuring it out, but how did you develop conviction about what you wanted? It was very hard. Like at first I had like, um, I didn't have a very strong sense of identity. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 21, it was sort of like, I didn't know who I was. Like, I can show you really funny pictures Mm -hmm. of myself that would show you that. Like, again, Alcoholics Anonymous, many, many years of therapy. Um, The artist way was really helpful. So tell me more about the artist way and what you learned from it. I mean, the artist way is all about this um, concept of like, we all have this like inner critic. That's, Mm -hmm. it's basically your parents, like voice in your head Mm -hmm. telling you the bad things and it Mm -hmm. blocks you from being who you want to be. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that was very formative for me doing that. I've done that like once or twice in my life and it really helps me kind of separate out, you know, the negative voices from my childhood versus, you know, who I really am or who I want to be. So what's the, what's the artist way process? Sort of like the fundamentals are, I'm probably going to ruin it, but the fundamentals are you write, um, you journal every morning called the morning pages. And that sort of like mm. gets out that like yucky kind of just mm. whatever's in your mind that day. Mm. You take yourself on artist dates. Hmm. Remember when I took you to the Singularity Conference? Yes, was that an artist date? That was an artist date. <laughs> Tell me more. What's an artist date? An artist date is where you take your inner artist on... Um, an activity. You're supposed to do it alone. Yeah. I did the first day yeah. alone. I took yeah. it the second day. But um, it's where you, it's like, let's say there's something you always wanted to do. So generally, like the artist way would be like for a banker that always wanted to mm. like take a pottery class. But mm. it's like, fuck it. I'm like a banker. Why should I go to a pottery right. class? But for me, it was, I'm a fashion designer. Why am I going to like a science conference? Mm. But like, you know me, it's like my dream mm. to go to a science conference. Yeah. But letting myself go there to the Singularity Conference and like listening and, and saying, you know what? Like, okay, there's some stuff here that's over my head, but for the most part, like 80% of this, like I understand what's happening and right. I am capable of this. That mm. also gave me a lot of confidence with Reformation because there was a big sustainability angle to it. And I thought, you know what? If I can understand this is the Singularity Conference, I can understand like the climate impacts of address. Yeah. What do you think about climates, I feel... It's a big, obviously a big conversation right mm-hmm. now. Where do you think the dialogue is wrong? Like, what, what are people missing? I don't know. Climate is such a hard topic for me because I like literally dedicated my life to it for 12 years. Mm-hmm. And I watched it go from being, I watched it go from being not at all a topic of discussion to all that everybody's talking right. about. And yet there's been very little pro, like hardcore progress. Yeah, And so... 
I'm a little disillusioned. So I'm like trying, it's been now since I left, you know, for the past few years, I've been on this journey to like, because I do care. It's just, I've been trying to get back to being like earnest about it. Mm -hmm. You also see a lot of people greenwashing in fashion and pretending right. they're doing the right thing. And there's just so much bullshit out there. So I am still course correcting myself. Hmm. Who are some people that you look up to or admire? It's really hard. You know, I really looked up, I really look up to Elon Musk. Hmm. But um, yeah, I really look up to Elon Musk. But it's hard sometimes, like, and it's also been like a growth thing for me, is yeah. like just because people's like people's personal behavior. And their business behavior and what they're building, like you can't judge people on all of those fronts. Like you, people are people, like they are valuable. And so you kind of have to like admire people for certain things. So I really admire him on a business level. Yeah. So talk to me about that because I feel a theme here is like complexity, contrast. Humans have complexity. The most interesting humans often have some of the starkest complexities yes. and contrasts. Yes. Um, and I think also for you, you've had that experience. And I think, you talked about humor being something that you value and care about, which means that like you're going to sometimes push boundaries. And like, how do you think about that? And how do you think about being a leader? Because we know that we need new leaders, but also pushing the line, right? Like how, you know, we're, we're in this sort of like cancel culture world. Any thoughts there? How, how do you navigate that? <laughs> Oh, that's such a complicated question. I mean, my personal thing is I think that there's like too few people that are very vocal on the social platforms that are dictating the way that our large institutions are behaving, including yeah. corporations. And I think that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. On leadership, I think we need to separate things. Like people can't be good at everything. And I think sometimes, and that's what I was saying, like not everybody is going to be amazing at cert at everything. Right. And so valuing people for what they actually are good at mm. and and letting them be human in, in their other parts of their life. I yeah, think it's important. Of, one of the things I've learned in interacting with others, but also myself, is sort of playing to strengths, right? Like we're told this yeah. myth of being well-rounded and whether it's you're hiring someone or you're thinking about improving yourself. There's this impulse to be like, oh, like, how do I become like good enough at everything? But actually, like, that's going to produce like an average result because you're you're beginning to average uh, across the board. But if you want like a superlative result, you really want to play to your strengths and actually, in some ways, not focus on weaknesses. I mean, you want to get them to a point where they're not self destructive, right? Like, because they can be. But that's what I'm hearing from you. It's like. I think we in a culture need to recognize that people are complex. They have strengths and weaknesses. And I think that we don't do that. Like we, we're, we're, it seems like for whatever reason uh, on social media and today, we want a very quick judgment on a person that's wholesale. They're good or bad. So you had some experience with this. <laughs> yes. Um, and to the extent that you're comfortable, like yeah, what happened? Yeah, I don't give a shit anymore. Uh, I got canceled. Yeah. Um, well, I don't even know how to describe what you got canceled for. Like for being racist. Ask, there so was tell some, me more. Some, yeah. There was people on social media that were accusing me of being racist. So this is, for some context, during employees, the BLM. Employees at Reformation, yes. This is during the BLM moment. Yes. 2020. Yes, in June. Summer of 2020. Yes. And... There was definitely, at the time, we were so focused, like I said, on the e-commerce that there was not enough like HR and people support in the yeah. stores. And there was definitely things that were happening in the stores that should not have been happening. And I was the CEO at the time, so I'm responsible for mm -hmm. that. And I I think overall it was growing really quickly and we did not have enough money spent on HR. So mm. to anybody listening, there's no such thing as overspending on HR and making sure that <laughs> I have, I'm, Susan's you know, love to hear this. everybody's yeah. following the handbook. Yeah. And that things are being done properly in all your locations, which they weren't. So you, I know you and you care about equity and you care about diversity. And, and what I'm also hearing from you, this sort of shaming and the canceling is just not an effective approach. For, well, it was very effective with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's effective in the sense that- It makes you, people feel really bad. But is that effective? Like, well, I mean, not, it doesn't affected? better society, right? Mm -hmm. There was like a ton of women. It was all women that were getting canceled right. and stepping down. And it's like female founders. Like, how is that helpful? 
How do you think about growing equity, not just with women, but you know, people of color and other minorities? How, how do you think about a positive way of growing it, growing equity? I think definitely putting like, I think, I mean, I think in terms of capital, like I'm a very mm. economics thinker. Mm. I'm not really like well-versed on other institutions, mm. but I think it's putting wealth in the hands of people from different um, genders and different races. Like if there are more black investors, if there are more female investors, there's going to be more mm. black and female and other gender mm-hmm. startups. And then those startups become bigger businesses and... I do think that there should be like within core. I I also think on boards, like boards is a perfect example. Mm. Like boards should be diverse. There's Mm. no reason why you can't, a board shouldn't be diverse. Mm. Like I think there should be some laws around diversity on boards. Really? I know you and I disagree about that. (laughs) That's a perfect example. Like let's just say you open up a marketing role and like you really just didn't get any applicants that are diverse. So, okay, now you have to like, go source diverse applicants and you're Mm. really, really trying. But on a board, like it's pretty easy to like, there's a much wider pool of of Mm. people to go for. And you think uh, even though there's just a few people on the board, their influence is so large, their representation really matters. Mm, Yes, but also I just think it's an easy win. Like I think about things in terms of like, where are some like, where are some wins? So you think that there should be laws that are like, if you have a five person board, you know, at least two of them should be female and one of them should be a person of color or whatever the statistics are. Yes, I do. Mm. I don't think it has to be like exactly matching the demographics of the country, but I think that there should be some minimums set up. And what what effect do you think that would have? It puts people in power of, you know, I think like what we're seeing is, is like mm. decision makers, like you said it yourself, like if the decision makers are homogenous then the decisions are going to be homogenous. Mm. So if you had your billion dollars or a magic wand. Maybe I have my billion dollars now. No, I don't. Um, What would you do with it by a yacht? No, I actually am not. I saw that um, triangle of sadness. I haven't seen it yet. Ugh. No, I will not buy a yacht. Yeah. I would incubate more businesses Mm -hmm. and I would invest in more businesses. And then I would um, have a bigger philanthropic footprint or effect or Mm. foundation. I have certain things that I want to invest in. Like I have a mission statement for mm. myself. Really? Yes. Can you share it? I hope I don't forget it. Um, <laughs> I want to um, educate women and girls in the third world. Mm. I want to close the wealth gap for women. I want to focus on climate change. I want to help people be healthier. Mm. All right. So just a couple, you know, final questions. Yes. If you were to, so you have a daughter. Two. Two daughters, Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, you've grown a lot and and you're a mentor for, you know, younger entrepreneurs. What would you tell your earlier self? I would have asked for more advice. Mm. I would have, like you said, like really hired around my weaknesses. Mm. I think like, I think a big problem, and actually I would say a lot of people do this, people hire around their strengths. Mm. And that I think is a big error. Mm. I would hire around my weaknesses, Mm. Um, like HR. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, hire around your weaknesses, Ask more questions. Don't be afraid to ask for advice. Mm. Like I think I, I've learned to ask a lot of questions, mm. and I have more confidence now. Right? Mm. I think you have to be very confident to ask a question. Right? Because you're admitting you don't know. You're admitting you don't know. Like you're stopping the conversation. Right. And I do it all the time. I also have like a real big habit of like being totally wrong. Like just mm. saying something that's totally wrong in a meeting, and then they're like, "That's totally wrong," and then I'll be like, "You're right." <laughs> but there's a confidence there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, okay. And then, okay. And then moving on and like not being bruised about it. Yeah. So, like, recovery time almost. I'm so often wrong that I just don't Mm. even, I'm, I don't even get phased too much. (laughs) But yeah, I'm, I don't mind being wrong. Okay. So then what advice would you have for like your, your kids? I mean, I think like, you know, obviously I'm not alone in thinking this, but I just, I get worried about people often like fantasizing about victim, Mm. you know, like, like I said, like, yes, there are obstacles. Don't focus on them. Right. Focus on your goals. Like, I think people are too often obsessed with all the obstacles. Mm. And you're not going to get to where you want to go like that. Yeah. I would say to them, I think there are distinct advantages to being a woman to my mm. daughters. And I think they should take advantage of those. Like or what? Sometimes people don't see you coming. Mm. <laughs> so there's like a subversiveness almost. Yeah. It's okay. Not yeah. everybody has to see you coming. Right. 
that could be a, a strength. I think so. Yeah. You know, I think women are good, are better at, um, like, relating to others mm-hmm. and picking up, like, you know, like I said, I'm not really, my EQ is terrible in a bigger setting, but on one-on-one, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. And use those types of things. Mm-hmm. So, do you have a new list? <laughs> yes. How many things are on your list? It's like, maybe like 25. Wow. Yeah. 25 things. I have no problem with being specific. Can you give me an example of one thing that's on the list? One billion dollars. I have a bunch of family Do you stuff. have a date by when you no, want No, remember it? I told you I try not yeah. to put dates to it. Which I like. It's a little greedy to put a date on it. Yeah, I, I personally have learned that a bit. Yes. Which is like, you can be very ambitious, extremely ambitious and goal-driven. However, putting the date on it almost can get in the way of, of achieving them sometimes. Yeah. From an investment strategy perspective, mm. I have a date in it. Right. like. But not on my like list. Mm. On my that list doesn't. Okay, have so dates. a billion. What well, like what's a family type thing? Like healthy, thriving mm. children. I want. I always want like a sexy, fun marriage. I feel. Is like. there an emotional thing on there that? Yeah, I want to be have a like for my body and mind. Yeah. Yeah. Like you want to be happy? Is it that? Yeah, kind I want to be happy. I want to have a healthy, strong body. Yeah. I I think I had something like you're gonna like it again with contrast, but. Why, like, I want to feel young, but be wise or something. Mm. That's like so dumb. Mm. I can't even believe I just said that. It sounds like a Hallmark card, but yeah, shit like that. And then I have properties I want to own. (laughs) I get specific. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. Is there anything else that I should hit? No, I don't know. You think I I think we talked about so much fun stuff. I know. I think we, I was going to ask you about like a favorite book. Is that interesting? Thinking Fast and Slow probably is one of my favorite books. I probably butchered the name. No, I think you got it right. I got it right. I love that book. What do you like about it? Uh, it just really taught me how to think. Yeah. Really, really focused my thinking. Mm. I love that book. What other books do I love? Well, you know, I love Sex at Dawn. I think right. all single people should read Sex at Dawn. What, what's the TLDR? What TLDR is too long, didn't read. Monogamy is hard. Mm. Monogamy is not ingrained in us. As a, mar- as a married woman, you know, in a successful relationship, you, you, you recommend the book. I actually recommend it more for single women, uh, single, single people. Single people. Yeah. I think it's really good for single people. Mm. As a, Or maybe if you're married and very horny and <laughs> <laughs> having issues, which I do yeah. not. Yeah. Babe, I'm really happy yeah. in her okay. marriage. Yeah. But like, yeah, I think that's a really great book for understanding interpersonal sexual relationships. What other books do I like? I don't know. We like the same books. What are you talking about? What are your favorite books? This is not about me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this has been amazing. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I feel like uh, I learned a f- bunch of new stuff. Really? That's crazy. About you, but also in general. Thank you. Um, I feel like you know all my stories. I don't know, though. I mean, I think uh, I didn't know the the accident of the editorial part okay. of Reformation. I think the contrast bit. That was fun. Um, that's, that felt like a theme. Complexity. Um, these intersections uh, feels like the theme. But thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for listening to Internet Misfits. I hope you found the conversation inspiring, helpful, energizing, and insightful. You can find me on the web to continue the conversation on my personal site, joe.universe, which is joe.univer.se. See you out there. Bye-bye.